Hey there, and welcome to this video. If you're studying linguistics at university, one thing that you'll need to do very often is to read research articles. That is, papers that have between 20 to 30 pages and that report the results of a linguistic study. Reading that kind of material can be difficult and it can take up quite a bit of time, especially if you're new to linguistics. There can be lots of technical terms, the writing is usually dense and not very reader-friendly, and maybe the author has used methods that you've never even heard of before. Yeah? If you've clicked on this video, chances are that you currently have a reading assignment, and for the moment things are not going great. Well, if that's true, you've come to the right place. In this video, I want to give you a few short guidelines that make the process of reading a linguistics article as efficient and hopefully as painless as possible. Now, let's first talk about the reasons for your reading assignment. Uh, my students get reading assignments for several different reasons. For example, it could be that they have a class presentation and so they read the article in order to extract the main points and then they present those points to the rest of the class. <clears throat> Another context for a reading assignment is when you're writing a term paper and it's your job to compare and to contextualize the findings of several articles. Finally, I often give reading assignments as part of a so-called take-home exam. So I give students an article together with the exam and I ask them to explain how the findings of the article relate to issues that we've been talking about in our class. In all of these contexts, the overall goal is actually the same. You want to have a basic understanding of the main issues, and you need to be able to explain those issues in simple language to someone who hasn't read the paper. Yeah? Let me make this more explicit. Your goal for reading a linguistics article is that you want to pass what I call the roommate test. Now, what is the roommate test? It goes like this. If you have read and understood a linguistics paper, you should be able to explain the following four points to your roommate. Yeah? So that's the roommate test. Um, as I said, four parts. The first one is this. What did the researchers want to find out? What was their research question? The second part is this one. What did the researchers do to address their research question? What data did they collect? How did they analyze it? Did they measure anything? Did they carry out an experiment? Yeah? This is something that you can explain in relatively simple language to someone who doesn't know the first thing about linguistics. Third, what did the researchers observe? What came out of their measurements or out of their experiment? Yeah? What are their results? And that brings us to the fourth item. What did the researchers conclude on the basis of their results? What answer did they give to their research question, and you see how we're getting back from the fourth point to the first point, the research question, where the circle actually closes. Now, in order to pass the roommate test, you need to be able to present these four items so that your roommate actually understands them, even if he or she is not particularly interested in linguistics. If your roommate doesn't get it, that means it's not good enough yet. Yeah? If your roommate doesn't understand what you're saying, you need to go back to work. Speaking of work, let's get to it. Yeah? We know what the final result should be, but how do we actually get there? What is it that we should do first? How do we get started? Now, I find it helpful to start with a piece of paper where I can put the four items that I want to extract from the text. So what is the research question? What is the analytical method? Uh, what are the results? And what is the final conclusion? If I have all of these on a piece of paper, I can make notes for each of them and I can start to get a sense of what is important for each single item. Okay. Now, many papers in linguistics are actually helpful in that they adhere to a structural pattern that is called the IMRAD structure. Now, what does that mean? IMRAD stands for Introduction, Methods, Results, and Discussion. And you notice that these four parts correspond directly to our four items. The introduction should feature the research question, the section about methods should explain how the researchers conducted their analysis, the results section tells us what they observed, 
And the discussion then moves from the empirical observations to the theoretical conclusions. Now, in theory, that sounds great. Yeah, uh, that is very clear. That should be easy to do. Now, in practice, it's often not that easy. Yeah, there are some problems that we need to talk about. And um, one problem might actually be that the paper that you are supposed to read may not correspond at all to the IMRAT structure. Yeah? It could be a paper that goes from one question to another and then to a third one without ever getting to a method section or a discussion of empirical results. Uh, that's terrible news in a way, but it doesn't mean it's a bad paper. It just means that you'll have to read it differently. You have to pay attention to different things. Yeah? But even if the paper adopts the IMRAT structure, which is what I want to focus on here, there are some pitfalls that we need to look out for. Yeah? So let's take this bit by bit, starting with the introduction. Uh, a linguistics article will typically give you quite a bit of background on the topic that the study is on. Yeah? That's the difference between linguistics and, for example, work in the natural sciences. Um, so it's not unusual to have several pages worth of descriptions of how this topic has been treated in earlier research, what one school of linguists have said, how another school has responded, etc., etc. Yeah, You need to cut through all of that. It's very good to know all of that, but when you present the main points from the paper to your roommate or to your classmates, you want to open with the central research question and not with a long lesson on its theoretical background. Students, especially when they're just starting out, they tend to get overwhelmed by all that background information that is presented in the introduction. And once they get to the presentation of the actual study, they are already overloaded with information. So important thing to keep in mind while you're reading the intro section, distinguish between background information on the one hand and information on the research question on the other. At the end of the intro section, you should have a clear sense of what the research question actually is, and you should be able to formulate it in your own words. That's important. Yeah? It should be a question that a normal person can understand. Think of your roommate. Yeah? Now, let's assume that you've made it safely to the second part, the method section. Here, there might be a description of a corpus study or an experiment or any kind of research design that the authors use to answer their research question. Again, that sounds pretty straightforward, but it often isn't. The method that the researchers use may be unfamiliar to you. The description of an experiment may be very dense and there may be terms that are completely new to you. Can be a challenge to work through that, yeah? trying to understand what exactly the researchers did. But um, what you absolutely need to understand is what the researchers measured. What is the data? Where does it come from? And what did the researchers do with it? Try and find that information first. Yeah? Did the researchers measure frequencies of linguistic elements that they found in a corpus? or uh, something that they found in a sample of languages from a database? Did they use sound recordings and did they measure aspects of pronunciation? Did they uh, conduct an experiment and measure reaction times? You know, that is the kind of information that you should pay particular attention to. Very often, if you know what the actual measurements were, you can relate those measurements to the research question and you can figure out more or less on your own what the remaining parts of the analysis must have been. So understanding how the study in your paper actually works, that's the most difficult part and the most important part of your reading assignment. Yeah? So this will be the biggest part of the time that you invest when you're reading that article. It will also be the part that is the most difficult to explain to your roommate, so be sure to work on this until you get it exactly right. Now, if everything up to this point has gone according to plan, you would proceed to the results section. And the main problem that's waiting for you here is the interpretation of tables, diagrams, statistical results, etc., etc. Now, if, like me, 
you are not a numbers person, this can be horrifying. Yeah? However, the good news is that it's not necessary to understand all the little details in order to understand the big picture. If you've understood the research question and you've understood what the researchers measured, you should actually be able to work out on your own, in your own mind, what observations the researchers expected and how those would look in a diagram, like a bar chart or a line graph. Yeah? And the big question is, are those expectations borne out by the data or are they not? So, if there are diagrams in your paper, those diagrams will typically visualize the data in order to show whether the researchers' expectations were right or wrong. Yeah? If the researchers present statistics, those statistics will typically be used to show that an expectation is confirmed or refuted with confidence, so that the measurements reliably show something that is significant. Now, as in the previous section, I would actually encourage you to work backwards. Try to find the diagram or the table where the relevant results are shown, and then try for yourself to work out whether what you see in that graph or in that table confirms or refutes the researcher's expectations, and then work backwards, go through the text, and try to understand all the remaining aspects in that section. Right. Sounds easy, huh? But trust me, there are things to be worked out here. Budget a little bit of time for this step. Now, in comparison to the first three steps, the fourth one will actually be a walk in the park. Yeah? In the sections of the paper that are dedicated to discussion, the researchers will present their main conclusion, which is essentially an answer to their initial research question, and that sometimes, if you're lucky, can be a simple yes or no. Typically, however, the final parts of a paper will take the discussion to a more general level. So here, the researchers might flesh out the broader implications of their work, they might draw comparisons to other studies, they might raise new questions that could be asked in light of the conclusions, or they might suggest follow-up studies that could tie up some loose ends. If you're still paying attention at that point, well, good for you, but uh, nothing except the general conclusion is going to play a big role for the roommate test. So these bits of information are nice to have, yeah, but you don't need every last bit of it. So once you've read through the paper as a whole, it's time to get your notes in order. Make sure that everything fits together and that everything makes sense to you. Remember the roommate test, yeah? You want to have all four parts of the article summarized in such a way that your roommate can understand what's going on. And, um, well, if something doesn't make sense to you, it won't make sense to your roommate either. Right. And uh, let's be honest, your roommate, you know, he's nice and all, but perhaps he's not the brightest person on the planet. So keep it simple research question, analytical methods, results, conclusion, you need to be able to explain all of that in simple language so that it makes sense to you and to others. Okay, all of this was purely abstract. Let's make it a little more concrete with an actual article. And uh, there's a paper that I selected for this that has been written by Holger Diesel and it has the title Iconicity of Sequence, a Corpus-Based Analysis of the positioning of temporal adverbial clauses in English. Right, sounds complex, but it's actually very, very clear. Now, if you want to do this as an exercise, you can download the paper, there's a link below this video, and you can do everything that we've discussed up to this point. So you would pause this video or shut down your browser entirely and come back to the second half tomorrow or whenever you have finished uh, Holger's paper. Right. So if you want to do this, go ahead. I will continue now. Right, the first step, uh, you remember, is the piece of paper with the four sections. Research question, analytical method, results, conclusion. And once we have that, we can focus on the first part of the paper and try to figure out what is actually relevant for us. And usually the title is a good indication of what the paper is all about. In this case, iconicity of sequence. What does that mean? Well, in a nutshell, 
It means that the temporal order of parts in an utterance line up with the temporal order of the events that they describe. So when we talk about two events and one happened before the other, iconicity of sequence would mean that the earlier event, event A, is expressed first, and the later event, event B, is mentioned after that. So uh, here's an example of a complex sentence that is in line with iconicity of sequence. Yeah? If I say, do the laundry before you watch Netflix, uh, event A is supposed to happen before event B, and I linguistically express event A before I turn to event B. Here's another example. Um, after you do the laundry, you can watch Netflix. Yeah, you see, it's the same principle. You do the laundry, that's event A. You can watch Netflix, that is event B. And the linguistic structure maps onto the temporal sequence of those two events as I conceptualize them. Okay, um, you can memorize iconicity of sequence uh, like this for clauses with before and after. So in iconicity of sequence, the main clause comes before the before clause and it comes after the after clause. Okay, that's just a simple way of memorizing this. Um, so far, I've only shown you examples where iconicity of sequence is actually respected. There are other examples where it's not. So um, <clears throat> here's one. Uh, before you watch Netflix, do the laundry. Yeah, I can say that. It makes sense. But the event that is supposed to come later is expressed first. Yeah, and uh, the laundry only comes after. Uh, here's an after clause. You can watch Netflix after you do the laundry. Again, ex event B is expressed before event A. Um, both of these versions are okay grammatically. Yeah? Both sequences work, whether or not they are in line with iconicity of sequence. So it's not that one is grammatical and the other one isn't, but it's that one is in line with iconicity of sequence and the other one is not. All right, that's the background. Yeah? And uh, now we come to Holger's research question, which is actually a very straightforward one. When speakers of English form complex sentences with before and with after, are they influenced in any way by iconicity of sequence? Arguably, if we present events in an iconic order, that would make it easier for our listeners to understand what we're saying, yeah? because the conceptualization maps onto the linguistic structure in a more straightforward way. So a more specific version of the research question would be whether it's true that in complex clauses, the main clause tends to become, uh, tends to come before before clauses and after after clauses. And this is actually something that you can measure and uh, that's what you should put on your note sheet uh, for your roommate, yeah? So the research question, is there iconicity of sequence in complex clauses with before and after that speakers actually produce in real life? Now, how did Holger study this phenomenon? Uh, his method involves the use of corpus data Specifically, he collected from a corpus complex sentences with before clauses and with after clauses, and he noted for each example the relative position of the main clause and the adverbial clause. So how often do we get a main clause before a before clause that would be in line with iconicity of sequence, and how often do we get the other order? And the same for after clauses. How often does the main clause come after the after clause or the other way around. That means the measurements for this study are observations from corpus data. Yeah? One observation for each corpus example is or is it not in line with iconicity of sequence. Right, again, find a way of putting that on your note sheet in a way that you can remember and a normal person can understand. Now, a couple of minutes ago, I asked you to approach the results section in uh, such a way that you should, in your mind, imagine the findings and then check diagrams or tables of results 
to see if uh, what the researchers found actually corresponds with your expectations. And uh, in Holger's paper, uh, there's a table that you see here on this slide. Yeah. And uh, it's a cross table that lists the uh, linear order of main clause and subordinate clause. And uh, it cross tabulates initial and final order with uh, after clauses and before clauses. So take a minute to look at the table and check for yourself whether or not that corresponds to your expectations. Yeah, you can pause the video and I will continue in three, two, one. Here we go. So what the table shows is that before clauses, yeah, the second uh, column there, are highly iconic. We find them at the end of the sentence, which is in line with iconicity of sequence, in 81 cases out of 87. Yeah? So that is a very, very strong tendency. Um, with regard to after clauses, they are also more frequently found at the end of a sentence, but uh, about one in three examples is actually found sentence initially. So what we're seeing there is that generally adverbial clauses have a tendency to occur at the end of a sentence. Uh, and with before clauses, iconicity of sequence reinforces this tendency. And with after clauses, iconicity of sequence has to go against that tendency, and that results in a relatively higher proportion of initial uh, adverbial clauses with after. Okay, now in this paper, the initial observation uh, is followed by a more sophisticated analysis that investigates three different factors besides the conceptual temporal order of events. Um, and this, if you like, checks how big the effect of iconicity of sequence is in comparison to other factors, such for example, uh, as for example, the length of the subordinate clause. So when speakers produce utterances with long subordinate clauses, those long clauses are typically placed at the end of an utterance. There's a famous uh, linguistic principle called the principle of end weight that explains that. So long structures are easier to process if they occur at the end. And what counts for us and for the roommate test is that conceptual order, that is iconicity, has an effect even when these other factors are taken into account. So the main point to note for the results is that iconic order uh, has a significant effect. It can be observed more often than we would expect by chance, even if we account for other intervening factors. All right, so that completes your basic summary of the paper, and uh, you probably know what time it is now, yeah? Um, roommate time, yeah? With your notes, try to explain everything here to your roommate. Will it work? Well, probably not the first time, but it will show you where you still have gaps in your argument. So what I would recommend is that uh, you, you read the paper one more time with your notes in hand and you check that your points line up with what is there in the article. All right, so that's it for this video. I hope this approach makes sense to you and that it makes your life just a tiny bit easier. If you have comments or questions, leave them below and I'll try to come up with an answer. Good luck to all of you with your linguistic projects and I hope to see you soon. Bye.